Uh, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, we're doing a pretty cool thing. We're, we're doing this hybrid style. So Kimi is joining us from Philadelphia, her home. This is Kimi Pryor. Uh, and for those of you who are online, I'm gonna wave to you here, you ought to be able to see me. If you uh, select the camera that has my name, Matt Chapman, you'll be able to view the gallery in its whole, or you could select Kimi and you'll be able to see her speaking. But we also have guests in the gallery, which are pretty cool. Uh, so really excited to try this out. It's, uh, you know, we're still figuring everything out as best we can, uh, navigating COVID and, you know, the, uh, the spikes right now. So we're just trying to make everyone feel as comfortable as they can and be able to join us if they can't get here uh, for distance or for any other reason they can join from the comfort of their home. So uh, we have Nicole in the back. Uh, she is handling our uh, our participants, so if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat, and Nicole will make sure that they are asked. And uh, yeah, uh, again, welcome to our, our virtual hybrid artist talk for Intercurrents. Uh, I'm really excited to introduce painter Kimi Pryor, artist Kimi Pryor. Um, she and I have known each other now for a number of years. We met at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia during our graduate school years. And uh, I feel like Kimi's paintings are just, they're incredible. I mean, they're so, they're so deep and rich and there's a lot of history in them. Uh, being able to have them on our walls for two months now has just been a real treat. And uh, being able to show with Kimi has been an even bigger treat. Uh, oh, thank you, Matt. I absolutely, absolutely mean it. It's so, it's been so great to be able to have these paintings here. Um, I'm wow. honored to be asked, so thank you so much. I was so excited wow. to show up Curio. <laughs> and so, um, I, Kimi, these are both new works for, for the both of us, right? Like, I know this, um, my contributions to the show, these are all brand new pieces within a year or two, but they're all made 2020 and forward. Uh, and so, Kimi, yours are new too, is right? Uh, almost exclusively, I think there is um, maybe two I made previously. Um, that one in the center, which um, is an older work, but I chose it because it really does some like world setting, which I wanted to bring into the show because I've never shown in Lancaster before. No one's seen my work. Um, and then there was uh, the Revelations was um, previous to making work for this show too. So, but almost everything else I made in the last couple of months leading up to this exhibition. That's awesome. Yeah, and, uh, and just because Kimi, you're talking about the uh, piece in the center, we also have a virtual exhibition up uh, for our virtual viewers. Uh, so you can follow along the show with us and, uh, and feel like you're here as part of the exhibition too. And uh, yeah, I mean, being able to, and this is a lot of work. I think there's about 15 pieces from each of us. Uh, and that's, that's a lot of new work. Uh, but I think, uh, and you know, we can start to talk about the reason like why we brought this show together or the conception for the show. Um, we've been afforded the time, right? Like when, when COVID uh, came and hit hard and we were all asked to stay home, I think it, it literally forced people to stay indoors and they had a lot of time themselves. And, and um, I think having time can be a real luxury and being able to be in your home and, and maybe you want to go out, but you can't, but you have to find something to keep yourself occupied. And for artists, for creatives and makers, I think being able to spend time in the studio is really important. Uh, and so, Kimi, maybe you can talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what it was like to have that time and, and, and make these paintings. What, like, what were you thinking about as these paintings are being created? Yeah, um, well, I didn't have as much time at home as some other people did. I was sort of an essential worker. I've been... Um, uh, commuting into the city during most of the pandemic. So, uh, but we, Matt and I are in a, a great group together and we have been having a discourse around the idea of depicting internal space. Um, so we had been talking about evoking internal space, whether meditative, psychological, emotional, spiritual, or imaginative space, however you want to think about it. Um, we had talked a lot about the idea of a portal and um, demarcations and transitions from one type of space to another, um, exterior to interior and vice versa. And uh, 
we both seem to like the, the ambiguity of whether these spaces and transitions are internal, like in the imagination or mind versus external, like in nature or the, you know, the environment. So I kind of thought of these works as like little ecosystems or droplets of water in which the world was sort of distorted and reflected and there was ambiguity between the interior and exterior. But um, due to, you know, due to COVID, we were both doing like meditation videos and thinking about your interior space and um, the concept of visualizing space in the body. And I think that's kind of what led to this idea of inner currents. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, you said it a couple times there, but the internal, external, uh, that's been really big for me. I think part of just my practice in general is uh, I, I still call myself an observational uh, painter, I call myself an observational artist, even though my work is largely abstract. I think you, like, we can always be taking in the world around us, uh, internalizing that, and then putting it back out. And I think that's what, uh, that's what people who make things do, right? So there's a lot of different lenses that you can kind of focus that it can be more representational, it can be more, uh, you know, like people write, people make music. Uh, so for me, it just kind of, I'm taking the world around me, internalizing it and coming out with these series of abstractions. Uh, and the majority of my works have a circular feel to them. Uh, <laughs> I think a lot of people who kind of been keeping up with my work are like, oh, he's a circle guy. But yeah, like uh, to me, a circle is, is just that perfect shape where it's influenced by its, by its environment, by what's outside, it kind of keeps that shape. Uh, but it also allows itself to be completely self-contained. There's a lot inside. It can, be, it can be quite shallow. Sometimes it could be extremely vast, it can be endless. Uh, and it's really been interesting to watch people come to the gallery, Kimi, because so many people see different things in the works. Uh, you know, people often relate yours to dreamscapes, or they'll be like, "Man, like this this space seems like a like a place I I recognize, but it's just different enough that it's not." Uh, or they'll, uh, with mine, they decide they try and decide if it's a planet or if it's a cell, like a like a microscopic cell. Uh, so I think what's really interesting are people are going inside, uh, but then other people are thinking about things that exist outside. Uh, and I, I, I just think that's so cool to see the reactions. So, you know, thinking about what the, what the exhibition was for a lot of people, they're all starting to get out now. They're like, even here in Lancaster, we've started to see a really big increase in people coming from out of state or just getting out of the house, uh, you know, because they feel like they find the candidates safe. So they're, they themselves are kind of coming out and reintroducing themselves to spaces and they come in and they see the works. And I just think that's really, really excellent. And, um, you know, people find really interesting things in the pairs. And Kimi, everyone's been saying uh, how much they love like the, the hanging of the show. It's not just like you're here and I'm here. We're all kind of like, we're, we're mixed up and we're, we're in conversation with one another. Well, shout out to Nicole too for the really thoughtful pairing and curation because you said she was really um, coming up with you know beautiful. Um... Oops. In the show where the works are talking to each other um, through the color and the formal relationships with like these deep solar reds and recurring planetary symbols and these hazy desert yellows. Um, and so for me, the success of the show is like through that thoughtful curation and like, um, which really expands the personal inner landscapes into like a richer sort of multiverse, I think. So, so Kimi, like looking at, like having been here and seen the show and like being able to look to the, the virtual exhibition, is there a particular pairing that you are uh, excited about? Um, well, I I was really drawn to your red um, portal, like that that really beautiful planetary red, um, with my little figure in the depopulated landscape and the red moon. But I think they really uh, strike a chord together, and I think the the recurring symbol of the the cosmic elements really keeps like a um, 
you know, it, it keeps the work in the, in the same universe. It keeps it sort of all in one sort of a faceted cosmos, if that makes sense. Yes, to me, that definitely makes sense. And, and seeing them together and being able to spend so much time with them and look through, uh, it's, it's really eerie because like when we were making these pieces, uh, you know, King's in Philadelphia, I'm here in Lancaster, we weren't necessarily like snapping photos and sending them to one another being like, hey, check this out, this is what I did, what do you think? We, we made this work. Uh, and then the first time we really all saw it together is when we brought it in to do the install. And uh, it was really striking to see the similarities between the pieces. Uh, and Kimi, just like as that, that relationship that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, and what I really love. Go for it. Um, I, for me, what I really loved was the materiality of the pieces, which like I hadn't seen your work in person, Matt, before this show. And like, you really need to see your surfaces in person and I think mine too like unfortunately for people who weren't able to attend this show like the work doesn't translate as well digitally as it does you know um, when you're seeing it in person because there's so many um, variations in surface and materiality which are just gorgeous like your your matte blacks and the sheen on the charcoal and these subtle tears in the paper you have are all very thoughtful gestures um, which really are so stunning to see, um, you know, at eye level. So while yours are really graphic and gorgeous, I really hope everyone can can make it there mm -hmm. and see and see the works in person because it, it really does make a difference. Like it, it's not translating, um, you know, quite as well. But to me, it's those little moments in person that really make this show like so special. I, I would definitely agree with you, Kimi. And like being able to see, like see work in person is, a, is of course a great way to do it. Uh, and with your work in particular, when you get up close to these, like, like I, I've, I've said a couple of times in the gallery now, like you could lead uh, excavation crews through Kimi's paintings. Some of these are so built up and so, so, uh, you know, textural. Uh, there's, there's history inside them. And I'm sure like if you could like kind of like peel off layer after layer, you'll find all these other like really fascinating secrets underneath the paint. Um, and I think it, it just makes you hang on to them a little bit more. Just being able to kind of be like, what's going on under there? Like, why are they, like, how are you getting those shapes? Uh, and so Kimi, like you've kind of, you said in the past that there are sometimes multiple paintings underneath the, the ones that you might be looking at right now. Yeah, definitely. Um, so not all of them. I, I'll start with gestures and uh, respond to those gestures and usually wipe the painting down and repaint it. And sometimes like it will end there, like Voyager, the one Navy and Sienna one with the ship was a very fast painting um, right there. But almost all of them are built of layers and layers and layers of added and, and subtractive processes. Um, and it's through, this uh, process of, of piling on the paint and sanding it down, wiping it down, rebuilding it, that I build sort of the bones and the composition of what it will end up looking like. And I like excavating at them like a, like a little archeological dig, like I chip at them and find previous layers of paint. Um, and for me, that all informs um, the, the final composition. It, it gives me more, to respond to. So I like I like that history and the process um, and the, the sedimentary layers that I uncover over time. And are you making sketches ahead of time for any of these or, or do they kind of form on as you're as you're working? Yeah, no, I don't have any preconceived ideas going on. It's just um, finding in the making, as Quint said in his artist talk. But uh, yeah, I uh, for me, the content reveals itself, like through time. I, I even if I try to plan something, it will end up completely different. Um, sometimes there could be like thirty paintings under there, and that makes me sad because I, I take photos of them while I work, and sometimes I look back and realize I could have had thirty separate paintings. You know, if I had just moved on. Um, I don't always know when to let go, and I'm trying to get better about that because. You know, I, I spent like one year working on a single panel and that makes me really sad because I 
I ruined that one panel, you know, so I, I need to be able to, to move on. But the, the act of, of excavation and these forming these sort of skeletal structures through paint is really important to me. And uh, I, I also tend not to sketch. Uh, when, I, when I come to these pieces, they're oftentimes just a, a nice fresh sheet of blank paper. And I, I kind of, I, I walk up to the piece and I, I just start. And uh, Kimi, you're talking about like you need to learn when to let go. Um, I think it, it's a really interesting thing for, for artists to try to negotiate when something is done or when it needs to be pushed a little bit more. Uh, it can be really easy for me. Like I find myself sometimes getting too comfortable in it. Like, I, like my work is, is uh, very surface. Like there's not a lot of things happening on the surface. Like I'm not going into it multiple times. Uh, I don't set it, set it down and come back to it weeks later and work more and more and more. Uh, the majority of these pieces all happen in, you know, one session. Uh, particularly the smaller paint pieces that I'm calling perimeter and release. Uh, those are particularly exciting for me because I, and like, I'm, for the people who know me in the chat and in the room, you may say, like, if you think about me, I tend to be kind of like, organized and, and hard edged and things kind of have their place. Uh, so for these, I wanted to still be in control of the, the page space, but I wanted what happened inside the paintings to be their own. So I would make these by taking a, like just a clean cup of water and a large brush and I would paint an empty circle, uh, just of clean water. And then I would insert the ink, I'd drop the ink into them. Uh, like I, I orchestrated where they went, but I didn't really control what they did once they were inside. And uh, that was a really fascinating thing. Uh, there are moments where, like if you see these in person, maybe the photo catches them, they may not, but there's little moments where like ink escapes from that circle and like gets it somewhere else in the paper. And usually I'd be like, oh, that's it, next one. But with these, it's, it's about letting go of that and, and kind of being okay with it. And now I've really come to appreciate those little moments that are, exist outside the paper. Um, and I can tend to, uh, you know, not necessarily attach meaning to things that happen in a piece, but I can, I can, uh, like reason with why it happened. So for me, those little pieces that got out, like that's that's very much part of the exhibition. It's about what's going on inside, but just as much about what's going on the outside too. So there's little bits that escape that I think are really, are really pretty cool. And uh, uh, Kimi, come, kind of coming back to imagery uh, some viewers of the show are kind of picking up on this idea of like the singular the singular figure the lone the lone being uh, is there is there are you able to kind of talk to that yeah um well i've always been drawn to depopulated landscapes and i don't know if because sort of like a dreamscape your your consciousness is sort of like the central figure but they're primarily about people having their own personal encounters with the cosmos. So to me, that's something that happens in private. These aren't about crowds, these are about singular experiences or aspects of self, like myself. They're sort of psychological self-portraits. Um, so for me, that that is dependent on having a, a lone figure. Um, yeah, I think in like a psychological, like I don't know if they're necessarily, you know, fictive spaces or dreamscapes or psychological spaces, but um, it's it's very much about my own consciousness and that is, you know, projected onto these little archetypal figures. So um, I think that's why I usually only have a single figure in the landscape because they're having their own experience. And you said something interesting just a moment ago. You said they, they could be dreamscapes or they could be psychological spaces. Do you think there's a difference between the two? I mean, I can't necessarily differentiate between them. Like, I'm not sure. I think my father who's here asked if they start with dreams and, and no, they don't. They, they start with intuitive gestures and the building of paint. Um, and I, I, built, I pull forms out of them over time, like from a Rorschach test, which is a, a psychological process. I mean, it's a, it's a process of thinking. Um, so, if, whether that's intuitive or psychological or drawing on some sort of energy, I mean, I can't, these are all sort of formalities that I can't really distinguish. Those are all sort of, you know, 
technicalities, but I, they definitely come from multiple sources, sources of the mind, I would say. Yeah, and, and again, I think I'm right there with you, uh, talking about how they, they start on gestural form. Um, you know, often, oftentimes, like I'll approach a piece, and I'm and like we, I'm in a unique situation where I, I happen to be co-owner of an art store. So when it comes down to materials and supplies, uh, if we see something come up that that looks really interesting, we're able to just kind of get one in and see how it works, and I get to play. Um, and it's a serious play, but it's play nonetheless. And I think if, if like you have a creative process, like letting yourself just kind of mess around is a really exciting way to kind of bring up things that maybe haven't appeared in a work before, or uh, they, they free you up to do things that maybe you feel like you can't do because you have like a particular way you need to be working. Uh, but there's a piece, it's uh, Convalescence number six. Uh, it's in the very back there. It's the large uh, one with the kind of like uh, cellular, uh, you know, perimeter piece in the middle and up on the screen now. Yeah, that one, uh, the, the really interesting thing about this piece for me is that it introduces greens and I traditionally don't use green. I don't know why, I just, it's not necessarily a color that I, that I find myself working with a lot, but uh, the, the series of convalescence all kind of, like the idea of con convalescence is, is a period of healing. Uh, it's like you're getting over something. And for me, this whole series, Convalescence number one through six, they're all here. Uh, it starts very much with like this feeling of, of frustration and chaos. Uh, I'm trying to maintain a small space for myself that's like quiet and, and uh, you know, my own. And as it, as it progresses, those spaces kind of get larger, but the exteriors kind of become a little bit more peaceful as well. Uh, and I've been spending a lot of time outside um, being kind of one of the only places you could go and get away would just be like, go find a park or a trail or, or go exist outside. So I brought that piece back in. But what was really interesting is I was, you know, freed up to kind of just work really gesturally with the pieces. Uh, I let the, the colors kind of do their thing and I, uh, I responded to that. And I think that's, that's a really kind of cool thing when you can kind of step back from your piece and allow it to talk to you rather than like you dictate what happens to it. And, uh, Kimi, it seems like your pieces are, are very much a conversation back and forth. Like it doesn't look like you kind of like impose your will on it or like force it to do something that it doesn't necessarily want to do. Uh, how often do you respond to what's already going on in the piece? Or like when you make a mark, you're like, oh, that wasn't what I intended, but I enjoy it. So let's see where it goes. Yeah, I mean, because they're not preconceived, you know, I start with, you know, gestures and they turn into ugly paintings and like, you know, they're, they're bad self portraits or they're bad landscapes and then I put them under my desk and I let them gestate and then I return to them and I cover them with paint and I sand them down. So it's really a process of continual mark making. Um, and I'm glad Nisa is here because I'm actually very influenced by Nisa Grassi, uh, my mentor in uh, critic at PAFA who, you know, rubs and burnishes paint in over time and creating these incredible um, topographical uh, landscapes and emotional landscapes. Um, so I think about, think about you a lot, Nisa, when I'm painting because, <laughs> you know, I, I think that, that, that buildup of, of repetitive movements, I think about Nisa and I think about the carpenter bees in my backyard who bore into these wooden posts with these like soft fuzzy bodies. And it's like, how do they do that? They're like these soft fuzzy things, but the intention of doing something um, over and over and over, you know, they've poured condominiums into all, all of our wood. And so I, I think about achieving like these crazy results with small repetitive motions. And so I do that a lot with sanding. I do that a lot with polishing and rubbing the paint in, rub, rubbing the paint off. Um, and I am also kind of thinking about like minerals and some of my precious stones and like stress and time and pressure. Um, and how, you know, these, these levels of paint could, could, you know, I, I would like them ideally to, to glow and gleam and, you know, achieve some, like a rich surface from this buildup. So that's, that's kind of why I'm, I'm into this more laborious, like method of paint application and removal. That, that same kind of like laborious, like you call it a laborious process, but that's also, um, a, a pretty common entry into meditations too, right? 
Yeah. Um, so we both practice meditation, right, Matt? Yeah. Um, so that was part of also what spurred this show is, you know, what the, the concept of internal space, um, what does internal space look like? Um, you know, is it expansive like the ocean? Is it like a claustrophobic space? What does it look like when you portray it? Um, and so I was also doing guided meditations. Did I say this already? Where you imagine you're in a grotto, a cavern, no. a forest, a mountain. And so I'm not very good. I know Matt's very good at visualizing with his mind's eye and I am not, um, but I feel like these shadowy impressions of, of landscapes that I'm not quite able to see is kind of show up later in my painting in some way or another. I particularly see that in Vista. It's a, really a, 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 it's a haunting painting. I and mean, like, you actually, like, to me, I feel like you have a number of haunting paintings, but uh, this, this one in particular, I, I, it's, a, it's a landscape that, that very much could be familiar, but it's not. And then you've just got these, I mean, you get really close to this one if you have the, the chance to. There's, there's just these subtle color shifts that, that kind of change and, and kind of pop up and then recede and then come back in other spots. And uh, I, I feel like I can really kind of understand what that's like in a, in a meditative sense. Like things will come into your mind and then they'll leave and you know, recede for a while and then kind of find their way back in from the other side. And uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting process. And I, I, I see that a lot in, your, in these paintings. So. Yeah, sort of fluctuating, hazy mental impressions. So, um, yeah, that's kind of what this, you know, it, it it's sort of disintegrating at the bottom. The top looks, you know, this, it's not quite finished. I, I would keep going on this one, to be, yeah. to be quite honest. But, you no, know, like, well, so you I, I like it when it's not necessarily pinned down into a, a literal recognizable, um, landscape. I, I, I do like an ambiguity of, of form and transition, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I certainly think that makes sense. And, and I am maybe on the opposite side of that, where I prefer things to be just a little bit more pinned down. Uh, you know, Kimi had mentioned that, that um, I also practice meditation. I've been a martial artist for the majority of my life. Uh, started when I was four years old and, and continued on and continued on. Um, I don't, I haven't practiced martial arts in a number of years, but I have picked up archery, uh, and I use that that time as my as my meditation because it's very much about focus and and it's just myself, my bow, and my target. Uh, everything else kind of falls away, and I would wonder if I, maybe I don't need to wonder. Maybe I'm wondering a lot, but the target that I'm shooting at, I think, finds its way into my pieces, uh, particularly like acceptance mirror. That one uh, really feels like a target to me. Uh, and uh, maybe, and I guess the idea of like pinning things down too is like I'm literally pinning my target down, uh, piercing those arrows. But I like the, I like the, the, the idea of being able to just block everything else out and focus on just one thing. And to me, that's a lot about what creating these paintings are. I, I step to my, my surface and everything else just kind of disappears for a while. And then I, I am so immersed in what I'm doing that I lose track of time. I will often forget to eat. I have, you know, it's just like, oh man, like you come back out of it and you feel really great. And you just feel like you can go back out there now and kind of do the things that you have to do or maybe the things that you've been avoiding or just be able to go back out of like kind of this like, okay, I feel refreshed. I feel okay about this. And then, you know, you can always kind of come back into that space and, and you have, you know, more things that you need that you've collected over time, you can just come in and dump it back out in your space. And um, Kimi, do you ever feel like you, you bring things back in from outside and just kind of like unload them onto the painting? Yeah, um, I think there's a lot of processing of current events in mine. Um, like I'll go through phases where they're, they're all boats or they're all people who look like they're, um, searching for, uh, you know, if I'm thinking about displacement, you know, people who look like they're crossing a desert or searching for a new home, or there's like, my mind just processes current events like everybody else has done. I, I read the news too much, I'm on Twitter, you know, I, I'm not consciously putting them into 
uh, my paintings, but I think, you know, especially with the uh, environmental collapse, like, <laughs> I, I think about that a lot. I think, you know, there's all these, these fires that are burning out of control and they're sort of like these holy, all encompassing fires on the beach. And I, I think that that is definitely a sign of the, you know, self-made end times that I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, us watching something burn, which is self-started and self-made, which is, but has gotten away from us, you know? Um, so I would, yeah, definitely as much as things are internally influenced, they're also externally influenced. Um, but Matt, yours look very much remind me of like reflecting pools and mirrors and portals and windows of, of consciousness and, and to project consciousness on, uh, onto, like gazing into a, a crystal or a quartz stone or something like there's a lot of depth and they surprise you when you when you look at them for a long time. Like you think you you have them pinned down when you because they're so graphic when you look at them originally, but the, the more time you spend with them, there's uh, subtleties and shifts and like these variations which are so subtle and so beautiful. Um, so they're very, yours are very much objects of contemplation for me. Yeah, and I'm actually really happy that you said that they're objects of contemplation. Like I, I also think about this, this, pro this process of creation that's called a uh, tantra object. There, it's a, it's, a, it's a way to, like, the people who practice Tantra, it, it's, they, they make this object, but they don't consider it to be artistic. Uh, but for example, it could be, you know, three, three red circles on a field with like light blue flecks all around it. They, like, we might look at that as, as an artistic piece because I think we're just kind of, like we're, we're in the culture of look at out, like look at imagery and process imagery and, and what is it and what can it do or what can it be? And we see color and we see shape and we see, and we see like, composition and we think, oh, art. But for the people who make them, they are very much objects and they will use them as, as a visual passageway to get to a space of meditation. Uh, and though I'm, I'm not gonna say that every one of these does that for me, uh, I think that the act of making them kind of does the same thing. So when you say they, they feel like reflecting pools, um, I think that's kind of true. Like I tend to stand over my pieces. I don't like, I don't work with them on an easel. Like they don't face me, I kind of stand over them. And as I'm working down, like I, I'm very aware that like I'm over top of it. And I do sometimes feel like I'm kind of seeing myself back in it, particularly uh, maybe in the more literal sense where I'm actually using a highly reflective paint. And I catch my, like the, the sheen of my hand over it or I'll see like this like blurry outline of my, my own body over it. And I become very aware that I've made something. Uh, so uh, thank you, Kimi. I appreciate that you found that in them. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So there's uh, there's two pieces in the show that uh, I kind of want to ask you about, and uh, it's Nicole, it's Headspace, uh, and it's a company piece. And I'm sorry, Kimi, the name is kind of escaping me at the moment. Uh, let me just run back and check it out. Yes. Space and monument. Yeah. Uh, were these two pieces made close to one another, or were they like was there were there paintings in between? Yeah, I made those um, for the show in a you know very fast amount of time and. Um, I was like, don't do the heads, like they're so literal, but they just sort of arose. Um, and so I, I went with it and I, I kind of, I kind of like the, like it's, it's funny, like it's a, it's a silly, like, you know, literal head, but I, there's something childlike and dumb about that, but also like, why can't that also be a portal into consciousness? Like just the, like a static sculptural head, like your impressions, like like how you see, how I was talking about in my mind's eye, like it's not a perfect head, it's not an anatomical head, it's just like a, a fast impression of a head. Like if I was gonna draw a head, um, you know, for- illustrations. Yeah, for illustrations, exactly. You know, it's, 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 not, it's not an ob observational head, it is just like, um, 
a series of mental spaces sort of overlapping each other. And it's like, uh, it's mental territories. It's sort of a dreamscape. It, they sort of evoke children's book literature, which I'm really into and inspired by. Um, I'm really, you know, into religious miniatures and other things like small scale things. So, um, yeah, so there was something sort of childlike about about them, especially Monument that I like. It was one of the last paintings I made for the show and I wasn't even going to bring it, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of glad that I did. Yeah. I, like, I, I like the childlike aspect of it, I think. And uh, Kini, do you feel like like there's space for humor in your in these in these works? Not in this, not usually. I don't think of myself as a humorous painter at at all. But like, why? You know, I I think maybe that would be good to be to be more playful. Um, and that's actually what I kind of liked about this is that it's a little less labored and a little less like, okay, I made this and I am fine with it being sort of elementary and childlike and playful, then why can't that be its own thing? Um, yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm going to not impose sophistication on myself, you know, <laughs> like, why can't that, why can't a childlike port of entry be like a, a as effective a portal as like a more sophisticated one? Yeah, I, I certainly agree with that. And that, I think that kind of comes back to the idea of like, allowing yourself to play in a studio. Um, and, and I'm not gonna, like I've never had to defend my, my works from being called like too, too playful or too, too childlike, but I mean, I said, like I'm working with, a, with a, a shape or a series of shapes. So the, like the, the uh, possibility of, like I often struggle with the, like, was it enough? Like, some, like sometimes I'll do something just real quick and I'll be like, oh, that's great. And I'd be like, but was it enough? Like, is it enough? Is it enough to feel done? Is it enough to feel like a complete thought? And I'm becoming, I'm becoming more and more okay with just being like, uh, it doesn't have to be any more than that right now. Like, it can just exist this way. And sometimes, like Kimi and I think you'll probably do the same thing. You set it aside, and it might hang out there for weeks or months, or or there might come an opportunity where it's like just the perfect thing that you need for an exhibition and you want to show it to somebody. Uh, but sometimes those things also just become recycled or you'll be like, ah, yeah, like I, I want that piece again because now I finally know how to finish it. Yeah. Or like, you know, they become labored, yeah. they, they, you kind of kill them. And we, you know, we have crit groups, so we see the evolution of people's paintings all the time. And, you know, someone makes something, you know, or people post videos of themselves painting on Instagram and their first couple of marks are like, so fresh and beautiful and then they keep working and you're like oh no you know like I, I loved it how it was but then you know who is it Picasso or something it's like your you, your first couple of marks are always going to be beautiful and your job is to work past that and find the true painting but um, you know sometimes when someone keeps going and going and going they, they lose sort of everything that you were responding to in the first place with this drive for perfection so that's something that I have to keep in mind for myself, because um, I I kill so many paintings, mm -hmm. and I look back at photos I took in process, and they were fine, you know, <laughs> existing in their previous states. I wasn't, you know, in my drive for perfection, I didn't love them, but in retrospect, they were interesting. They were interesting enough, and I wish that I had been able to put perfection aside and let some things just lie. Yeah. So, and uh, Nicole, you're on an, you're on an interesting image. If you just hop down a little bit to the to my piece that's on that screen. Uh, this one, this to me, this is one that illustrates that really, really nicely because I uh, was very unsure of a lot of the movements that I made on this piece. Like I started with this, with this really really white yellow orange wash in the back. I had that that white circle in the middle masked out. Uh, I, that was the one thing I was sure of with this piece. Is like that I want to be completely masked out. But I started with that with that really nice orange yellow wash, and then I added like the heavier reds and the heavier yellows, and I was really nervous to do it because it's like okay, like it's not that I get one shot at it because I can get another sheet of paper or I can I can you know find a way to work with it. But I, to me, it felt like I had one shot to get it, and when I got it, I felt really like excited about it, 
And then it was okay, but I don't think it's there yet. And I need to, I need to keep pushing on this one. And, uh, but you know, like, Kimi, you just said, like, you know, you watch people in the first couple of strokes, they make a great, and then you're like, no, don't keep going. Um, I definitely had to fight the, like the, the part of me that said, stop now. But I was like, no, 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 like, I gotta keep going on. And I'm really, really glad that I did. Adding that, that graphite over top and just going to town with that piece of graphite and then going back into the water and like, like really like being pretty violent with it for me. Like I'm, I was like really just kind of like getting my whole body into that motion. Uh, it felt really good and terrifying at the same time. And I think that's kind of when like really exciting things happen in your studio. Uh, when, you're, when you're kind of like so far out of your comfort that like you can't even see it anymore and you just hope that there's a line you can grab on like you just feel around in the dark until you get something that feels familiar. And then you pull yourself back in and you, you're like, okay, I came out of that. And I've got something really, really special. I feel like that, that piece in particular does it for me. So, Kitty, we are coming up on quarter to eight, and um, I'm wondering, is there anything in the, in the chat, Nicole, as far as questions? Kitty answered the one question in your head. Gotcha. You can have other people. Yeah, like, are, do, we, do we have questions here that we uh, would like to ask either Kimi or myself for the pair? Mm -hmm. I, I wish you answered the other one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what was it? I want to know. So this is asking about both of your processes, and I know that Kimi specifically said that she wasn't trying to focus too much on it all being dreamscape. So I was just kind of curious on how much of an effect different dreams and like sort of the mental state of the whole pandemic and everything affects a lot of the work. I mean, so we can, I can definitely speak to that last bit when you talked about the pandemic in general. Like the pandemic really, to me, uh, it shook me up big time because, you know, Nicole and I had, had just opened Curio. We only opened for a couple months and then we were asked to close. Not even asked, but like forced to close. Uh, the semester at, at PCAD was, was still in swing and we only had a week's time to be able to kind of regroup and figure out a, a digital syllabus and what that whole landscape looked like. Uh, my other employer, um, as like a residential painting company, like that shut down. So it was just like this whole like massive halt to things. And it was really quite shocking and jarring. Um, and I felt like I've always been able to manage stressful situations pretty well. Like I, I think through things that usually stay pretty cold. Um, but I found myself getting uh, very uptight, like, like internally uptight, maybe not outwardly. Like I, I try to keep myself very like even keel. But internally, I was really feeling things and like, you know, your, your link to the outside world at the time was like reading the news. Or like that one time you go out to go, go to the grocery store and you know you feel like you're just kind of like using your cart to keep people away kind of thing. And it's a, it was a really strange experience. So for the pandemic for me initially started off very abruptly and got very, uh, to me, very aggressive quickly, internally aggressive. And I needed to find a way to be able to, to release some of that. Uh, because being living in a city home, I can't very well go shooting arrows in my backyard. Go flying off and do something crazy, but I'm fortunate enough to have a, a studio space where I can go and I can make things. Uh, and to me, that is absolutely what got me through. And that was a really large motivator for the majority of the pieces that are in the show. Uh, so perhaps had the pandemic not occurred, maybe these pieces wouldn't have happened. Uh, which is a, a strange way to think about things, but I think if perhaps if the pandemic hadn't happened, a lot of things might not have happened. Uh, for better or for worse, I think that might be a true statement. Um, so, I mean, Kimi, is there anything you'd like to, to add on that? So, the, I'm sorry, I didn't fully hear it. It was how has the pandemic impacted you through your work? Pretty much, yes. And if sort of like your dreams or even the, the mindset at the time, how much of an effect did it have on your work? And uh, was... Well, my dreams got very dark during the pandemic. Um, and uh, I think, like I mentioned before, I. You know, I, I locked down for a little bit, but then I, I had to go back to work. So I was I was working in the city for for most of the last two years and, um, you know, wasn't vaccinated and the commute was filled with heroin addicts and it was like no one was wearing masks on the trains or the buses and my dreams were getting very, very dark about, you know, 
not having masks, about not having oxygen, about people dying in subways or tunnels. So um, I, I did a couple of paintings and somewhere in a, another show I just had that were like death came looking and some, some other death centric ones because uh, it was something I was thinking about a lot, like mortality. <laughs> And you know the the mortality of of the people I was seeing every day, and the, like my own mortality. And I had just moved into a new house, and I was like, I hope I'm around to enjoy it. It's just like no one knew during the the early stages of the pandemic how serious, how widespread it was going to be. So uh, my work was already pretty apocalyptic and like alienated. So I wouldn't say it got way darker, but I think it did. I think it did get darker thematically. Particularly in Voyager, Akimi. I know we kind of, we've, we've talked about this piece a number of times now, but I can't help but kind of think of that as like, as, as a, as mortality. Like it's just this, it's this figure to me on a boat that's just adrift and their only sail was their soul. And that's, you know, leaving them actively, actively leaving them. And then I just think like, well, what, what happens when that sail is gone and they just drift? In that in that kind of really bright sea, but in that like dark sky, it's a very strange. Yeah, thing. so they could be you know transitions of of being, but definitely death is one of the <laughs> things that has been on my mind this year. So um, thanks, Nisa. I'll take it. I love all Nisa's references. Yeah, and, um, uh, yeah, that's a good question though. There is some questions in the chat. I'll read this one from Matthew. Okay. So there were there's a lot of talk about landscapes, whether psychological, metaphorical, etc., in relation to both your works. Does physical travel outside your normal spaces inform your work in specific ways? If so, have you found that the recent pandemic restrictions on travel have their own different influences? Yeah. So, Matt, that that's. That's a really excellent question. Um, I would I would say the answer is yes. Like being able to not like we haven't traveled traveled. We've gotten in the car and maybe gone out an hour or two, but we haven't gone like we haven't gotten on a plane. Uh, haven't done much in the way of like public transportation trains or anything like that. But uh, I do find myself kind of um, only going in the places where like that are local. We'll say local, maybe 20, 30 miles. Radius, but we would regularly find ourselves at a park, Lancaster County Park. Uh, and that place is so great because there's so many different landscapes you can get into and there's little areas you can get away and be by yourself. There's a spot where you can sit and you know you're going to see 10 other people walk by. Um, and so green spaces became really important because you know, you're, you're in the house, you can't go to all the places that you usually like to go, but you can definitely go outside. It was almost like one of the last comforting places to go. And, uh, and the time was there, at least for a little bit of it. You could just feel okay with going to the park and being out for an hour or two, because that's, that's just what there was to do. But uh, I did also find myself, and Nicole too, I think, we would have conversations about like, my gosh, do you remember when we were in Joshua Tree? Or do you remember like being in Kauai or like California or when we went to Maine? Like you find yourself kind of remembering the, the, the spaces that you would travel to regularly or had plans to travel to. And uh, I would, I, there, there's not a moment in, in any of my pieces where those spaces come back right away, like very literally, but the, uh, the kind of atmosphere that exists outside of some of my, like some of my portals, I think are probably pulling from those spaces, both remembered and, and observed. So uh, Kimi, how about yourself? Yeah, I think, well, previous in my previous, existence. I, I think my work might have been inspired by going to Italy and looking at Italian art and dialoguing with Italian artists and like weird gothic landscapes. But now it's, you know, being at home all the time, it, it is more about putting on the meditation video and imagining <laughs> yourself somewhere else. So I think I, you know, like every, like a lot of people you've had to turn inward for imagery um you know we we go for hikes and we go in the backyard but I, I think that has led itself to a lot more reliance on on mental spaces and like the you know the inner currents the inner landscapes than than previously when we were moving about in the world more freely 
There's another question from Steve. Says, is slash should the artist be concerned as to whether the viewer understands or has insight into what feeling or idea the artist is trying to depict? You mean, did you were you able to hear that? Uh, I read it. It's okay. yeah. So why don't, why don't you take that one first? Oh, uh, let me reread it. Um, uh, I don't know about concerned. Like some some people, some advice artist, you know, people giving artists advice or like think about what the viewer wants to see, and I hate that because it's catering your work for ex expecting someone else's like anticipating someone else's reaction or experience. And I think people are reacting to what you genuinely are making stemming from yourself. And it's your own humanity and weirdness and personal vision, which people respond to. So I think it sort of, if you, if you cater yourself to being popular or like well-liked or on trend with the art world or something, I think you, dilute a lot of people might relate to. Um, so I don't think you should be so obscure that like nobody can understand you. But I think when people come up to me and say, I really related to your work, it's because I am making work that stems from myself and I'm not trying to make like trendy paintings, if that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and, and Kimi, I, I feel like I'm, I'm kind of, uh, falling on that same path. I'm not necessarily concerned with if someone's going to to like arrive at the same place that I did when I made the piece. But what I am interested in is that people find a find an entry point to it. And when those when those paths align, like when someone comes up to me, it's like this really made me feel like I was, you know, kind of some somewhere chaotic, but in the middle of it, I felt like it was going to be okay. Like, I'm like, yes, that's great. Like that makes me really happy. But I'm just as excited when someone comes by and, and says like, you know, I really, I really think of these pieces as planets. I, when I made them, I definitely wasn't thinking planets, but I can see where that's coming from. And it's, I think it's just exciting that someone spent the time to engage with it and see something in it. And then let alone decide to come up to me and tell me that. Um, uh, to me, like I, I love talking about these pieces, but uh, I, I think it's a it's a really great thing when someone feels uh, strongly enough about an artwork to go and actually talk to the person who made it. Because it can be an easy thing to be like, oh, I've got I've got a thought, but I'm, they probably don't want to hear it. It's yeah. nice when you know you can go up and you can share that with somebody. I think it's a really cool thing. If, if to me that means that the piece has been a success when somebody else like is is moved enough to speak, I think that's a really cool. But on the other hand, I think you should design your work. So, you know, if, if people are not getting what you want to come across and you need to rethink how you're designing and communicating your work. Um, yeah, so okay. I wouldn't cater to people, but I think that you should consider the design of your work in terms of how it is being communicated. All right. Well, well, guys, any any other questions here before we decide to wrap? I have a question for you, Chen. Yeah. I'm curious to your thought process behind mounting the paper onto the wood panels rather than <coughs> sticking with the traditional frame. Sure. So, uh, oh, let's see. so uh, the question was talking more technically about how the pieces are constructed. Uh, so my decision, like, I, I there are pieces that I want to be objects, and there are pieces that I'm fine with existing in, in a more flattened space. Uh, to me, like de deciding to mount the paper to the board, it, uh, you know, point, like it brings it off the wall. There's no frame around it. There's nothing binding it to its face except for the, the length. So bringing it off the wall, it creates a, a much deeper shadow. It makes it more object. Uh, it makes it like more of a, more of a thing. Uh, rather than something that's like pinned behind something else or, or like encased like a cell or like a, a slide. Um, and so choosing, like I like working on paper. I feel like I, and speaking completely technically, I use hot press watercolor paper because I feel like it gives me the, the cleanest mark without dealing with a lot of the other textures that you get out of cold press. 
and choosing to mount to the board was just a, a great way of being able to uh, first secure it because I knew I was really going to get crazy on the surface. I didn't want it warping or pulling or, or coming up. Uh, and then like, at the end of it, I knew it was going to exist more as an object than like a, a, a piece maybe if we're buying. So, technically, that's where that's coming from. So, well, uh, everyone, we are just about eight o'clock. And uh, I'd like to really thank uh, Kimi for being with us this evening and, and spending some time with us. And uh, a really giant thank you to everybody who joined us. Uh, giving your time to, to make for an artist talk, uh, particularly on a, on a Monday evening. Uh, it really means a lot to have you guys here with us and everybody virtually too. Uh, it, it's just been, it's awesome to see everybody's name pop up in the chat. It just really makes you feel like what you're doing is, is important and worthwhile. And uh, so for all of you, and I think I speak for Nicole too, it really makes us feel great. It feels like we did something uh, special and important, kind of like I had mentioned a moment ago. So yeah, Kimi. Thank yeah, thank, I wanted to say thank you so much for coming. I know everyone is super zoomed out and like exhausted and I really appreciate all of your time and it's really nice to see all of your faces. And thanks Matt and Nicole for having me. It's really been a joy. So um, thank you all for coming. Yeah. It's really and, nice uh, chatting with you. Yeah, and this exhibition will be up in the space until the 28th. So you still have a little bit of time to come in and see it if you are virtual and feel like you can get out. Uh, come on down and see us and uh, yeah. Stay tuned for the next one. It's going to be great. It's right. so wonderful to see two of my favorite students uh, together. And thank you, Nisa. Thank you, thank you. We love you, Nisa. 